All right, what's up guys? What's growing on? Pete here with Green Dreams. And for those of you that haven't watched my channel or don't know who I am, we are an ecological landscaping company based out of Tampa, Florida. I have a farm base that's just north of Tampa and we do projects all over the state. Uh, today, I am back in LaBelle, Florida doing a follow-up on a project we installed a year and a half ago. Um, this project is on a multi-acre site. I actually forget the exact size of the property. I think it's around 20 or 30 acres. We are in a real scrub pine habitat. Um, this area was clear cut before we got here. And when I originally made my first video here, everybody was asking, you know, what's going on? What is that in all the paths? Is that concrete? And no, that's not concrete. That is just our typical Florida sand. And you can see that still on the main path, on the main driveway, probably a little bit in that drone footage, but compared to the original video I've done, it's definitely a lot lusher and things have filled in here a lot. So first talking point I wanna bring up as we're walking into this site, there was a lot of animal penetration. Being out here on 25 acres, not having a house, not having continual presence. Um, the homeowners, Bill and Judy, who own this property and this had, had started this project, they don't live here. Um, this is kind of like a weekend getaway. They come out here to harvest their fruit. They come out here to prune. They come out here to be in nature, but they actually live in the city. So they had a lot of animal penetration, a lot of deer, a lot of hogs. What ended up actually being the worst out here were the rabbits. Um, the rabbits completely ate down that perennial peanut ground cover that we installed. And the Mosa way out competed the peanut here on this site. You could see what they've done here with this fencing system. Um, this is a solar powered fence and it's a double fence. So anytime you have a deer issue, it's very important to have a fence in front of a fence. So they have a two foot three strand and then behind that, you know, they have a six foot eight strand or something like that. You know, it's a double fence that's ran off of, like I said, solar panel system that's kind of set up over here on this corner. And that's really helped them to get established out here without the deer coming in and eating down those trees every day, hogs coming in and rutting up the site. So the only thing that's made it past this are probably the snakes and the rabbits. Um, and they've actually installed recently some rabbit fence to really even stop that. So first thing I can tell you is when we showed up here, um, you know, there was, there was no butterflies, there was no beneficial insects, you know, and the first thing I noticed when we pulled up today, the place was covered in butterflies. The place is covered in bees. The place is covered in beneficial insects. So it's really exciting to see things starting to thrive and take off. Um, Judy had told me she does most of the pruning here that they didn't cut back the goldenrod last year. So it had gone to seed. So you guys are gonna see a ton of these tall, what to look to be like weeds, but they're not actually weeds all over the site. Um, lots of salvias, lots of calyandras doing really well. I noticed that the bottle brush tree had some flowers on it, or at least the other one did. Um, Lots of tick seed in here, wax myrtle in here, mealy grass in here, um, scorpion tail, that's the goldenrod coming back, gallardia, rutabecchia. Um, we used a lot of that native coral bean as a nitrogen fixer here, it did really well. You could see the caliandra again, that's that scorpion tail with that pretty white flower on it. And then in this far bed actually at the entry point, there's lots of nice flowering trees. So like I said, we had the bottle brush in here. There's some tababuyas in here. Um, this looks actually to be a big jujube. I missed that when I was walking around earlier. Everything is due for chop and drop right now. Um, you know, the homeowners that take care of this place, they actually just found some help. They've got a local guy that comes out. Maybe they said three days a month to kind of help them with that chop and drop if it becomes a little bit overwhelming, especially during those summer months. So they left everything tall for us today so they could really, could really see just how thick it, you know, things are out here, how much stuff is grown in. I mean, I actually thought there was something wrong with the soil here when we started this project. Um, you know, there was no weeds. There was nothing going on even in the dirt. And I will say a few things have not thrived here. The Japotacabas crashed. Um, I forget what else they mentioned crashed, but a couple things didn't do really good. Even the mulberries got a little bit on the yellow side. They said that after they put some magnesium on them, those really came back nicely. They said the figs are doing really good, which I was impressed with, with these sandy soils. Um, mulberry coming back, you could see they just treated these all with some magnesium. So I mentioned this site is in LaBelle, Florida, and we're based out of Tampa. And we are actually in a very, very similar climate to LaBelle being north of Tampa. And I know when you hear that, you think, wow, that's crazy. LaBelle is east of Fort Myers. How is that possible? But there is a huge difference in temperature when you're on the east side of 75 to the south side or to the west side of 75. So, you know, we are 45 minutes east of 75, which brings us inland. So really good because we're high. We're on the back end of that Lake Wales Ridge. Um, but really bad because we can get really cold out here. So when we did this project, we did install some coconuts. The coconuts are still alive. The homeowner knew we were pushing them out here. We have a tropical zone over on the other side with some mangoes. Those are still doing pretty good. 
Um, you know, no problems yet. She said the bananas got a little bit zapped this winter, um, but the leaves came right back. I thought that was interesting. The bananas took damage and the coconuts didn't. Um, you know, usually it's the other way around. The coconut will take a, you know, a dump before that actual banana does. Um, this avocado, I think, had some fruits on it. Avocados definitely seem to stress out a little bit when they start to fruit. That is a joey. There's Brogdon, there's Poncho, there's Lula here. And like I said, this is all goldenrod. You can see the butterflies dancing. Uh, a couple pear trees here in the center. And just like every other job we've done, the bananas that fruit the most are the ones that are always in that zone one. And on this project, zone one would be, you know, the cabin, the outdoor shower, the shed, um, you know, where the area where they congregate, you know, where they have the most presence, you know, they're constantly putting that organic matter in this banana pit. So we put a banana pit right here outside of the shed. Um, and you know, these ones she said have already fruited three times. So they're going off. Here's some of that goldenrod. And if I come back in another couple of weeks, this whole place is gonna be covered in these yellow flowers. Probably one of my favorites for bringing in beneficial and predatory insects. I've seen goldenrod growing from here all the way up to Maine. So probably not the same exact species, but it grows all the way up the coast, probably all over the West Coast too. Not quite sure. Um, over here on this side, you can see these mangoes and you know, something I'm gonna tell you guys. First thing I said to Bill and Judy when I walked the site when we got here, have you guys been pruning these mangoes? And they're like, we haven't pruned them at all. I'm like, how is that possible? These trees are getting really nice shape to them. Um, these are really decently shaped mango trees for not getting a lot of love or pruning. These were planted as three gallons, you know, year and a half old from three gallons, nice shape on the tree. We just discussed some tipping with them, a little bit more pruning to get them to actually set a heavy fruit. But I would say that these trees are gonna fruit this year. Um, yeah, these things are coming on here really soon. So super exciting to see those, uh, those mangoes start to probably fruit. This area, like I said, we're in, you know, 9B. It can get cold here, it can get frost here. You know, we knew we were pushing the edge here. We actually put some overhead irrigation in this zone. It has a protective zone. Um, you know, so if we get that one cold night, you know, where we're gonna get a little bit of that frost, that water will stop that frost from settling on there and insulate those plants. You know, they have that hooked up to um, a wireless connection from the timer. So with Wi-Fi, you can actually control that from your phone and home. So, oh, hey, it's getting down to 29 degrees tonight, kicking on for four to five hours. Typically in Florida, we only get three, four, five, six nights like that. So it's not a big deal if you got to turn on that overhead water just to protect those few nights to actually get that fruit set. So there's other things like um, sugar apple in this bed. Kind of see what's growing on over here. This one is really exciting. This is another one of those pretty flowering trees. This is a silk floss. And would you look at this? Don't climb that tree. All right, so that beautiful silk floss going off, nitrogen fixer wax myrtle. Um, homeowners have said they really love the Fakahatchee grass. It's one of their favorite grasses. You know, we grow that as a high silica uh, form of mulch. That gets used in our chop and drop system. So like I said, all of that Mexican sun sunflower, Tithonia diversifolia needs to be cut back. Well, that is pound for pound equal to chicken manure. We cut that back, we put that around the bananas, we put that around the fruit trees, then we lay that grass on top, and that's where we get that carbon-nitrogen ratio and that breakdown process. And that grass really helps to shield that stuff while it's breaking down. Uh, whoa, here we go. What's ripening? So, rack of Namwa bananas coming on. They're just starting to blush. That's the best time to harvest this rack. You'll cut this off. You'll hang it upside down on the back porch and eating them as they ripen. For those that don't know, once a banana fruits, it's dead and you constantly have a pup coming up and taking its place. So you can see a couple more mangoes right here. Lychee, Suriname cherry. I see those sulfurs going nuts in here. A couple Vitex trees. I see a couple more Suriname cherries. As you can see, another mango, uh, Simpson stopper, giant goldenrod. And here's another pretty mango tree, really nice shape to it. That one's a cog shell. I believe they have fruit punch out here, coconut cream. There's one of those coconuts. So those have grown probably a foot of hardwood since we've installed them. Um, you know, they're probably ready to fruit. So if we have another mild winter, I would say they're gonna fruit this upcoming year. So here's one thing that I was, I was surprised with. Um, the sweet almond and the firebush like almost hardly grew at all. Like I could almost not even tell that there was a difference when we planted them, which is abnormal. Normally, you know, the firebush can get to be like 15, 15 foot. Same thing with the sweet almond. Um, they didn't do a lot here. They have not put on a lot of growth since we installed them. So like I said, peanut didn't do so well. 
firebush isn't growing like it should um but otherwise everything else is really pumped out and you know it's going to be like that not every single solitary thing you're going to plant is going to thrive you know we try our best to pick the right species for the right area but sometimes you just don't nail it oh strawberry tree montingia calabrera okay so for those that don't know, this is a cold sensitive tree. This is one that dies practically every year up at my place. I replant this tree every year. It fruits almost all year long. This is also known as like the Captain Crunch Berry. Um, and the fruits literally taste like cotton candy. It's definitely a must have if you have kids. Um, definitely a must have if you're anywhere, you can grow a subtropical fruit tree. And just know if it dies in the winter time for the cost of this tree, the 35 bucks, I mean, no big deal to replace it every year. And the fruits are unbelievable. Really, really good. I'm actually going to sit here and geek out for a second. Maybe eat a couple of these. Whoa. All right, you guys getting tired of watching me eat fruit? I think so. Oh, Royal Poinciana. So big old Royal Poinciana over here. Like I said, a couple of Tababuya trees. I see a Cassia in here. Whoa, look at the size of this guava. That's what I'm talking about. Whoa, that thing is ready to harvest. I could smell it. So it's like a Barbie pink it looks like, or a white guava. Here's another big boy. Wow, that one practically looks like an orange. Whoa, that is a stud. All right, so big guava um, out here on this outer edge. You know, a lot of the same planting species that we had been using, the coral bean, the caliandra, the Mexican sunflower, um, lots of whack myrtle. The big change in this outer bed that comes around the outside are the large are, are the large live oaks the moringa trees and citrus so something that the homeowner definitely knew they were risking putting in here would be citrus um, there's lots of you know heinous agriculture in this labelle area if you guys seen when i put up the drone there's lots of sugarcane being grown out here mostly citrus though and they clear cut these huge lots and they put in you know a monoculture of citrus and you know today we have the you know the greening problem it was the canker it was this it was that anytime we plant anything as a one species, as a monoculture, nature is going to find a way. So, um, like I mentioned, the, the citrus is definitely pushing it here. Um, it's doing okay. It's grown a lot since we actually installed it. And I was just telling the homeowner about a little pro tip with using the leaves from the oak trees, um, actually drenching those in water and doing like a foliar and a root drench on them every six weeks. Um, they're already showing some great research with starting to reverse the greening process. So it'll be inter this interesting to see what the long-term results are with that. But I can tell you that, you know, since I made this citrus video in the woods, there's been all kinds of epic research that's come out to support my theory. So exciting stuff. You can see the big moringas in here. Um, those are upright uh, with Lacucci viburnum, citrus, viburnum, wax myrtle, caliandra. And, you know, this whole entire place is really just engulfed in uh, the sunshine mimosa, mimosa strigolosa, that's our nit nitrogen fixing ground cover. And I could tell you everywhere I've dug around a tree where there was a thick mimosa ground cover, I almost got like a, like a urea smell on my hands. And that, that smell, you know, I smell when we're planting those plants and we pull them out of the pot and you can smell it when it's actually in the ground. And that smell is that plant with that nitrogen fixation. So he said he just came through here and cut this. When he cuts it like that, he's really stimulating those roots and getting those nodules to actually release that nitrogen. So could it be another reason why I was really smelling it? Um, something else to mention, I guess, the peaches and the plums. You know, we know it's cold here. We know we got interesting soil. They have not really kicked butt. Um, you know, they're just, they're okay. They're not really leafed out very well. Um, they've been pruned a little bit, but they're just not the healthiest looking peaches and plums I've ever seen. Something I can tell you is I looked at a lot of these root balls and we noticed a major ant problem here. A lot of competition, lots of different species of ants. They have the ant bro bait stations. They've got eight of them. They've been out of bait for a year. After talking with them, they're ordering some more bait. They're gonna get those up and pumping again. They definitely said that they work. So I'm gonna reload those. Here's another, not the happiest looking peach you've ever seen, um, but the beds are completely dense, you know, and. Something that I've seen none of here is torpedo grass or nut sedge. So a lot of the weeds that they are getting are the soft weeds, the easy to pull weeds, one patch of Biden, so not very common. Um, big Moringa, ooh, that one even got a pod. Look at this. Okay. Whoa, Moringa, the most nutritious terrestrial plant in the world. Yep, this one's like having a health food store in your backyard. 
Whoa. Spicy, but good for you. Big old caliandro, and here's that closed in fence. We're at the back side of the garden. And let's see what's growing on over here. So, homeowners had so much fun with this project. They decided to put in a large annual bed, probably started at the wrong time of year. Um, they got that going here in the summertime and really probably should have waited to fall. So anybody that's here in Florida, you know, our time of year that we can grow annual vegetables is typically like September through March. The rest of the year is what, in my opinion, when we can grow the cool stuff. So in my personal opinion, the best time of year to grow is the summertime. That's when we can grow the fruit trees, the perennial vegetables, you know, that's when we get our backyards looking like Costa Rica and we're actually in Florida. Um, you know, I walk out my back door and most people say like, wow, where am I? You don't even recognize it. So that is what's fun about growing stuff down here in the summertime. Um, the sky's the limit. Seriously, can you guys believe they grew anything in this? Look at this soil. It's not soil, it's beach sand. I'm telling you, right amendments, game changer. Oh, I see a citrus with some citrus on it. Here's some olive trees, lots of thithonia. And you know, out here, I'm noticing some dinkier bananas. Like I mentioned, the bananas are always a little bit bigger in that zone one. So as we work our way out, you know, I noticed they're getting smaller and smaller. Um, bananas are heavy feeders. That's the trick. You have to feed them to get them to fruit properly. So big oak trees over here, coral bean, fakahatchee grass. I see uh, more pods on the moringa. And this place is just the jungle. You know, as we're walking down these paths, you guys can really see, you know, <laughs> what's left of that sugar stand kind of coming through. And to think that this whole place was just pure sugar sand. And now it's an abundant food forest, thriving with beneficial and predatory insects, feeding people, teaching people. Whoa, more moringa. Nice. These seeds can be used as a flocculant and actually take um, dirty water and make it drinkable. All you have to do is boil it. Um, wax myrtle. Oh, I see a bird's nest over there inside the oak tree. Pineapple guavas. Here's our true native firebush. This is the big leaf one, Hamelia patens. One of my favorites. There's some decent bananas. And do you guys see that chop and drop? Yep, that's the homeowners. They love cutting back the Fakahatchee grass. Mexican sunflower are constantly laying that biomass on top of those bananas. All right, it's a jungle. So I kind of feel like walking through here has done no justice. You guys are gonna get a better idea of the site from all the epic B-roll. I got Robbie with me today. He's actually helped with some of the film work. Um, Robbie does all of our video editing. Um, and then obviously the drone from above is gonna kind of show you a little bit better. I mean, I think the place is a little bit overgrown right now. Um, I think the goldenrod kind of gives you that maybe a weed-like appearance. Once it's all flowering, this place is just gonna be golden and lush and glowing. Um, but for the most part right now, I don't know if you're seeing, you know, what we're actually seeing from down here. So I hope you guys enjoyed this follow-up video. This has been a super exciting project for me to come back for something, you know, a year and a half after you install it and to see fruit and to see things thriving. Um, you know, like I said, one or two things crash. That's just nature of the beast. That's part of the game. Not everything is always going to thrive. We did the best we can you know, to hit it the first time, but it doesn't always happen like that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this follow-up video. If you like this video, be sure to hit that like button. If you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and do so. Most importantly, you know what we do around here? We pound dirt.